Well, let's do it. Shall we do another? Yeah. Great. This is Out of the Dark, an audio series about Dark Hall, a theater built in 1929 in Regina, Saskatchewan. In this series, we will explore Dark Hall by hearing the stories of people who've been touched by this historic performance space. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Episode 3, Theater is Good for the Soul. Marianne Woods has had a long career in theater and music. She's toured North America as a musical performer. She was in HMS Pinafore at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. She taught drama and musical theater for Class Act Studio in Regina, and she has trod the boards at Dark Hall many, many times. Her first high-profile gig there was in a 1979 Regina Lyric Light Opera Society staging of The Red Mill. In the May 11th issue of the Leader Post of that year, Denise Ball reviewed The Red Mill. She says of it, Female vocalists excel in Red Mill. Over the years, Regina has developed a tradition of bringing talented members of the community together and, with plenty of hard work and determination, mounting shows that win through sheer energy and enthusiasm. The Regina Lyric Light Opera Society's production of The Red Mill, which opened Thursday evening in Dark Hall, is no exception. The Red Mill by Victor Herbert, one of the founding fathers of the American musical theater, is based on a hackneyed plot full of predictable, two-dimensional characters. Yet the production, directed by Bruce Lawson, is full of exuberance and manages to come up with enough freshness and vitality to more than compensate for the artistically rough edges and staging difficulties. The story of the Red Mill centers around Gretchen, the burgomaster's daughter who is in love with Hendrik, the captain of a ship who regularly visits the small Dutch village. The problem is that the burgomaster has decided to marry his daughter off to the governor, who has a high social position, as well as overwhelming debts. While the male members of the cast show considerable acting ability, it's the women who take it when it comes to vocal performances. Eileen Saganaski is the Countess de la Fleur, a visitor to the town who complicates matters, and Marianne Woods as Tina, the daughter of the local innkeeper, who goes into rhapsodies over anything that smacks of romance. Both give strong support to the whole production and match the standards set by the female leads. The efforts of groups such as the Lyric Light Opera Society should be applauded and encouraged. Shows like the Red Mill provide the community an opportunity to see and hear many of the talented people who live in Regina, as well as giving amateur musicians and actors a valuable performance outlet. It's encouraging to see that Regina audiences still appreciate the time and effort that goes into the city's amateur tradition. I spoke with Marianne Woods about how her career has been tied up with Dark Hall. Six or seven, when I used to take, I took piano lessons from Frances England, and I, she lived on Leopold Crescent, but she, she taught at her home, but we always had our recitals at Dark Hall. Right. So I, um, I'm sure that I have some programs somewhere that uh, you know, talk with listing all of the students that uh, she taught because I took from her until I was I think in grade 10 right. but yeah so yeah my history goes back a long time so like grade 1 grade 2 grade three. yeah grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 wow well she was probably um, one of the I mean she had a, she taught I think well into her 80s and had a lot of really great students that came out of her studio and some went on to professional careers and some um, some just enjoyed the piano itself for the teaching and I I value that um, the time that I worked with her because it just helped me to read music and then I moved on to singing I was more interested in singing but because I learned so much from her I uh, I was able to continue music as part of my life yeah. you know so 
So I, she, and she was a great teacher and really well respected. I mean, the Lowe's lived right next door to her, Don, Donna Lowe, and uh, the Lowe family are just such a musical family and have, you know, gone on to great things. Yeah. But, so it just seemed like the, a really cultural <laughs> street <laughs> that she taught on, you know. So, yeah. 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 So I really valued her, and and years later, even after I stopped taking from her, she was still so interested in what I was doing and you know the path that I was was on. Yes, yeah, she was very strict. Yeah. yeah, she was, and she knew like you. She knew if you hadn't practiced, you know, yeah. she could tell. I remember her her saying to me you have to keep your knuckles up and you have to make sure that you know you're do your scales and do yeah. things properly so yeah she would and and if you did a good job she would give you one of those pollen's chocolate puffs at the oh, end of the lesson <laughs> when you were young when i was younger yeah. but yeah what if you didn't oh we wouldn't get one yeah <laughs> We were, when we took our exams, we were in the rehearsal halls or the, um, I guess it was called, it would have been like a um, hall that they used for adjudications and exams. So I was in fact in the recital hall, they called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was part of, in the conservatory. Yeah. And I, I went on to um, study at the conservatory with teach, singing teachers like David S. Scott. He had his own studio there. And so we used, we, we used the dark hall for music festivals and we used the recital hall yeah. for music festivals as well. As, and there were lots of different rooms that were used in, in the old college building for, yeah. a, for a music festival. There, you know, that was a major family event, yeah. the end of the year, the big recital. So the parents, you know, would put lunches together and tea and coffee, and it would be a, a sense of celebration. So I do remember one of the first recitals that I did, I was terrified to even go out on the stage really? and so yeah so she you know I, I think I ran back to backstage and then she said no you just go right out there and and then I played my piece and everything was fine and you know took my bow and left but this the nervousness of it I think being in front of an audience like that was was a big deal yeah. you know for all of us I think <laughs> Um, and when I got into high school with going to Central Collegiate in my, in my grade 12 year, um, we had a small, limited theater space in our high school. So we went, our music teacher and our drama teacher booked Dark Hall for our production of Guys and Dolls, our grade 12 production of Guys and Dolls. So that that became, you know, just like the broad way of, <laughs> of your, your high school experience yeah. because we actually had dressing rooms and we had a backstage area, though the wing space was not very big. Yeah. But we had this opportunity to go to a bigger place and put on this theatrical presentation with a, with a um, orchestra pit and, yeah, having those having that opportunity was really wonderful for so many of us yeah. in that in that case you know it just because I had been in that space as a child doing yeah. the studio doing the recitals and then um, also um, doing music festival as well I, right. I performed there but just to do a musical was just marvelous. I guess for me, it was uh, just having an opportunity to perform there with a, a full orchestra and uh, this just to be able to perform on that stage was wonderful. And it was one of, I mean, I, I when I got to high school, I kind of dis started to discover you know, that I love to do musicals and my 
that my abilities were there and that's where I felt I belonged, the people that I was with, and we all created something really special. So it was just, it was just a wonderful experience for me. And I knew that I, that's what I wanted to do, you know, either professionally or non-professionally with my life was to be involved in those kind of shows for the rest of my life. And the people that I met, I still, I still have long-term friendships from, from that show that I did, you know, that we did together. I still keep in touch with, with a couple of those people actually. And, and, and my music teacher, Mr. McAhoney from Central and my drama teacher, Mrs. Ramenda, they're both gone now, but they had a huge impact on, on me and, and uh, what I was doing at that time. And there, they had a fine arts program at Central that I wasn't really involved in, but there were a lot of people that were in that, um, in that program that were involved in the musical. So I think we, um, we all got so much out of it and the joy that, you know, and the dedication that those teachers had for us was really remarkable. So I, I cherish those, those years that I had there doing the music programs and singing in choirs and choristers and folk singers and, and the people that I met that, you know, like Bob Evans is someone who I went to school with and Rob Bryant and, and they're both amazing musicians and they had a, a really positive influence on me as well. Nice. So, yeah. So when you were doing Guys and Dolls at, um, at uh, Central Collegiate, would you guys, uh, when it came time to do like dress rehearsals and stuff, would you walk over from school to Dark Hall or would you go there in the evenings? Yeah, or? we usually, we would do, um, we'd walk over from school. Most of the time it was kind of an after school thing. So, and at that time they had those, um, and I think we did some evening show, d- evening rehearsals as well, like when we got closer to the time. But they had that wonderful tunnel that went from dark from the conservatory to dark hall. So that was kind, of, and I knew about it from years ago. So that right. that was kind, of, that was just a wonderful adventure of, you know, getting a coffee or something in the cafeteria in the conservatory, and then or a drink, and then walking underneath the tunnel and you know going into yeah. dark hall so it was kind of mysterious and fun and nice. i mean it was falling apart even then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that's years ago but yeah yeah so we would yeah we would definitely you know walk over there and and do our rehearsals there when it got closer to the time yeah roughly what years was that that was 1973 mm-hmm. that i was in grade okay. yeah was in grade twelve. Right. How did that performance? Do you remember how the performance of Guys and Dolls went off? It went very well. Um, I think we did three or four performances. We did a matinee. It was really well received, um, and I remember it would be. It was very special for me because my auntie Molly came to visit from Winnipeg to see oh, it. Really? And she was a singer. She was never a professional singer, but she she loved singing oratorio and um, classical music and um, competed in the festivals in Winnipeg. And she she came to see it, and that was just very meaningful for me that she did that. And at that point, it was just my mom and I, because my dad had passed away when I was in grade 11. So... Mm-hmm. For her to make that effort, and you know, I had a very good friend all the way through high school who came, you know, she came to see it, and you know, family members came to see it, so it was, it was very meaningful. And I still have photographs from that too yeah. <laughs> of that show. Oh, I'd love to see it somewhere. Well, maybe some backstage ones, but just yeah. people that I that I worked with. Yeah. So that was, it was very meaningful. And I just remember thinking, oh, you know, what am I going to do after high school's over? I'm not going to be able to do any musicals anymore, but what, what will it, you know, what will, how will life, how will life unfold? But then of course in the fall, you know, we, 
um, some of us got a chance to audition for some other shows that Regina Little Theatre was doing in connection with the IODE and co-productions, which ended up de- being done at the Conexus. So we kind of found our feet and were able to continue with what we love to do. Now, what was the neighborhood around there like? Because now it's very... that transition from where Central Collegiate was to Dark Hall, that's currently a lot of seniors high-rises and a lot of the houses have been converted into businesses and offices and stuff. Uh, what was it like back in the 70s? Well, I lived in in um, in um, the Crescents, so I okay. used to walk to, to Central back and forth all the time. Yeah. I remember it being quite residential, yeah. From what from what I recall, it was very residential. So there, there weren't. Uh, in, it might have just been starting to move into that, it, more up businesses and offices. But there were always lots of you know, lots of uh, uh, apart. Well, and I lived I lived in that neighborhood. Um, after my dad passed away, we moved to. Um, or well, while he was ill, we moved to the Prince Charles Apartments, which is still across from where the old Central used to be. So there was a confectionery across the street, and there was a base from where the Prince Charles was, and there was a baseball diamond across the way. Now that's now Central Park, and yeah, it was definitely there were and Spears Funeral Chapel. Yeah. has been there for years and years and so there there definitely were more apartments apartment buildings that seem to be cr- um cropping up and being built yeah. but uh yeah it it was and my mom was working downtown so she used to be able to walk to the medical and dental building downtown from where we lived and nice. yeah it was it was definitely changing at that time in the 70s but that f- confectionery was a place that you know all the kids would go to and I just loved living across the street from Central because I could go home for a spare or you know just and be able to walk walk to school and then walk over to Dark Hall when we had our rehearsals so you're listening to Out of the Dark a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM, CJTR, tuned into the community. How did you start with Lyric Theatre? Well, um, I, I f- first worked with them in 1978, or no, 1979. I had... I worked full time and then I did these IOD shows and some Regina Little Theatre stuff at the Conexus and sang in groups and stuff. But uh, that was a show called The Red Mill and it was lyrics started up again in 1978 or they started in 1978 because they saw a need for a musical group and it was more op- operatic based or uh, you know, musical opera theater um, kind of operetta like Gilbert and Sullivan and mm. this show was a sh- they, so I think they their very first production would have been um, HMS Pinafore I think and wow. and I wasn't involved in that because I was singing in this group at uh, called the Canadian Connection at right. the Delta um, which is now the Delta which was a Sheraton so I Sheraton Cavalier so I was um busy doing that and then that just ended and yeah. and these auditions came up for the Red Mill in 1978 and uh, I uh, I auditioned for this role and that was the first time that I had been in a lyric show and again you know it was a wonderful experience it was directed by a man named Bruce Lawson who used to work for Alan Blakeney was his aide and wrote all his speeches and he was originally from Australia but he um he brought together a a really interesting group 
of actors and musicians. And again, like that was just a really special experience. And my friend Garth McLean, who I sent that picture of the, yeah. uh, the when he was doing that yoga handstand, he was in it and now lives in LA and is is you know at times an actor and has and but also a yoga teacher so there were there were a lot of really again a lot of really talented people that were working in the community and we had a full orchestra and we rehearsed at St. Mary's Anglican I think it is on 15th Avenue yeah Yeah, that's where our rehearsals were okay so so they went on to do musicals there for you know many years I I moved on to Toronto in I guess 1981 to pursue a professional career but they continued to do their shows at at uh, Dark Hall and I guess when I came back to Regina which was uh, December of 1990, the first show I saw there in 1991 that they did was Kiss Me Kate, and I was just so excited to see that they were still continuing. And then some people went on to start an organization called Regina Summer Stage that works out of the Regina Performing Arts Center. So so they've, you know, they continued to use that space, and they used to have these... Um, Lyric used to have these shows at um, St. Mary's where they would do like a pub night, and so people were very, very involved in in that uh, in that organization. What was your favorite show with Lyric Theater at Dark? I guess I would have to say that it was Hello Dolly, which we yeah. did in 1995. And uh, when I came back to Regina, I did the gon- I think I did the gondoliers mm-hmm. with them, and um, a couple of smaller shows like reviews. But Hello Dolly was was the most special. And a young man that was in it with me, well, Colin Grewer was in it. I did lots of shows with Colin when he was living here on CBC, working at CBC, and a young man named Paul. Alexander Nolan, who's originally from Rolo, um, he and I worked together. He's he's gone on to great things. Like he's been on Broadway. He's he just finished a run of a play called Slave Play, which is being taken to uh, the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. So he was someone I I had done The King and I with in 1992, I think, with Summer Stage. But so. He working with him, and there was a man named Jack Woolley who was very instrumental in starting the lyric show or lyric organization. So they were both in it. Robertson, who's very well known, was the director. Um, Ernie Cassian was the conductor, and we had a full orchestra. So I'd have to say that that was that was the highlight for me was doing that show because it's a show I'd always wanted to do. I'd done before and been in the chorus, but the role that I playing Irene Malloy, who was the the owner of the hat shop, and Colin and I were you know love interest, and Paul was his sidekick Barnaby, and so. There were just some some really talented people in that in that show that you know like Paul who've gone on to big things in their careers and yeah. and have pursued pursued their their dreams and done really well. You've had this like long career, this long history with like theater and musical theater. Um, what did that What did that give you in your life? Oh, it's just given me a sense of belonging and a sense of wanting to uh, just be part of that, like to have that as a part of my life. I mean, I I guess because music has always been in my background. My my mom was a pianist. My auntie Molly was a singer. My grandpa was a singer. I just found I I found a sense of belonging that I had something because I wasn't into sports really and yeah. but I just felt like I, these are my people you know yeah. what I mean and we are making a connection and we're creating something special that will never be duplicated I mean this show will be done you know 
Guys and Dolls will be done or Hello Dolly will be done by other groups, but it'll never have that kind of special meaning that you created this with this group of people. So I just never, I never get tired of auditioning for a play, even if it's just, even if it's in the community or if it's at Globe Theatre, because it just feeds my soul and my passion. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, it's, you know, provided me, um, when I moved back to Regina with an opportunity to teach as well, like teach and do some drama and musical theater classes for do it with class or in the Regina public school. And those, uh, those young people that I've met over the years, they just, they, I just think, Oh yeah, there's a future happening. And I should tell you a story that doesn't have anything to do with dark hall, no, but true. last week I auditioned for a play at little theater and uh, I didn't get cast in the, in the role, but that's fine. But there was a young, young woman who auditioned who I taught when she was four and a half years old yeah. and she was auditioning for the younger role like it was an older woman and a younger woman but they're they're the same person but over the course of the play it's a place called now and then anyway her name is Ailish and I was so excited that she auditioned and I hadn't seen her in quite a few years and she said do you know I not remember me but you were my teacher I'm Ailish and you're the one that you know made me so passionate about wanting to be an actor yeah. so it just I'm like I'm getting emotional talking about it but and then she's she's gonna she's gonna have a role in this play but she's when I saw her auditioning and how passionate she was and I mean she got involved in improv in her high school and she's but she just she's grown up into this beautiful young woman who's so passionate about acting and I know you know she's gonna continue doing it whether Mm. as a professional or in you know community and so those kind when I see that kind of you know future that's make it just makes me keep wanting wanting to do it for as long as I can why do we need the arts why do we need drama and theater oh gosh I I just think people need live theater and live music at this time particularly to be able to reconnect I went to see a play the other night at that Curtain Razors was producing at RPL Film Theater and uh, it's a one man show um, about um, a man and his relationship with his mother 94 year old mother and you could just Again, I could just see that the people that were there really wanted to be there. It it just it just fills such a void uh, for for you know the odd and and I went when I went to see Charlotte's Web Little Theater did that at, in December and the theater we were all wearing masks and we all had to show proof of vaccination but there were little kids there you know seeing the show and. Um, just the, that whole, you could just see that people were hungry to be able to yeah. get out and see uh, a live performance and something that they could take their family to. And um, I just think it it feeds your soul, feeds the audience. And whether it's, you know, fluffy or whether it has something relevant to say that's socially important it's just it just feeds your soul like i i have i i need as an actor to go and support other artists in the in the city because i want to be able to see what they're doing and and the and when i did a little theater play in september we were just back to doing the season the just to be back on stage just to be in rehearsal just Oh, it just helped your your whole um, your soul, and you just felt like you were contributing to the community. So, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
On the front page of the You section of the November 24th, 2018 Regina Leader Post, there is a feature about the Regina Little Theatre production of Anne of Green Gables, directed by Bob Nichols and starring 15-year-old Elizabeth Booker. Just below the fold, there is a photo of Marianne Woods as Marilla Cuthbert. Across from her sits Dan Carr, who plays Marilla's brother, Matthew. Like most of the people involved with Regina Little Theatre, Dan Carr is not an actor by trade, but rather, he has a career as a visual artist and graphic designer. We sat down one day and he told me about how his history as a performer with Regina Little Theatre all began in 1981 in Dark Hall. Uh, well, um, my dad was a performer for most of his life. Started out uh, in the 60s on Red River Jamboree, part of the band, the house band on that TV show. And so growing up, I, he was always in performing. He was always, so I always, I just assumed everybody was always performing. I didn't know any different, right? Um, and, but I was never into performing. I just, I was a visual artist is, is my, I, I made a career out of that, graphics, you know. Um, uh, but uh, my dad went to an audition for uh, a director of the opera, was the play in, I think, 1980, directed by Hilda Allen, the great Hilda Allen. And uh, he said, you should come along and uh, maybe work on sets, because you like painting and stuff. And I said, yeah, that sounds like fun, I'll come along. So we went, uh, I sat beside him during the auditions, and Hilda called on him to read for the director. And then she called on me, she said, you young fellow, read The, the Sun. And I said, oh, I'm just here to, to work on sets. And she said, you read, because you didn't argue with Hilda. So I read, and I sound exactly like my dad. And I was reading for the part of the sun. And we look alike and we sound alike. So I got the part, even though I had no idea. Uh, and that, uh, back then, Regina Little Theatre did three shows for every, uh, every run. And they were all at Dark Hall back then. So that was my first time ever on stage was... Uh, we rehearsed at the, the old puffed wheat factory on Saskatchewan Drive there. That's where Regina Little Theatre's home was. And uh, we, had, we would load up and take the set over to Dark Hall and set up the set. And that was my, my very first uh, show ever. It was a uh, director of the opera in Dark Hall in 1981, I think. Wow. With my dad awesome. as the lead. And Steve Arsenich, I think, was in it. The yeah. Local celebrity. Um, that's my, my first memory. All my friends... I was, that was basically my social circle, was uh, Regina Little Theatre, and uh, Dark Hall was pretty much our, our venue, you know, that's, that's where, we, where we performed and where we hung out backstage and where we, the little tunnels beneath, you know, we, we hung out down there and, you know, explored and did whatever Amazing. early 20s kids did, you know, <laughs> and theatre kids did. Right. <laughs> yep. When you're in your, like, I was, I was 20 when I started with RLT, uh, right. and in your early 20s, your sense of history and the weight of you know the yeah. the actual number of people who have been through there and what's been through you know what has happened in that venue and and you know the actual weight of the history that is impressive is very impressive yeah. uh, it's kind of lost uh, was lost on me at that age but as I as I got older and moved away and then came back and uh, now I work on College Avenue ever since they've renovated it uh, my 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 connection to Dark Hall and my fondness for it and my understanding of how important it is like as a, as a uh, an artifact of Regina and and it's I'm so pleased that it's still going to be running you know and it, yeah. they're renovating it and it's it's uh, yeah it uh, uh, I have a great fondness for it which has grown a great deal over the years you, you mentioned when we took, spoke on the phone that you had there was like a gang of you would yeah. like hang out there like who were these guys and oh, what did you get up to they're, they've all uh, wandered away ever since then but uh, I can name a few names uh, a fellow named Doug Hickton uh, he was very big in the local theater community and uh, he's gone on to he had a show produced off Broadway uh, he did a musical version of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari it's actually very good uh, yeah and he worked with Ken Mitchell local playwright to do uh, a musical called uh, All Our Yesterdays um, and yeah so he, uh, I was part of that you know uh, it was nice to be I, I all my friends were were theater people they were creatives they were uh, they liked writing they liked performing they liked music so I, I was very happy in that kind of venue. I love being around the fine arts of any kind um, so yeah uh, I mean we didn't get up to any real trouble I mean we you know we misbehaved ever so slight we thought we were bad radical you know we weren't we were nothing uh, but uh, 
Dark Hall is a great venue to hang around backstage in because it's kind of labyrinthine, you know, mm -hmm. the, especially downstairs. There were like tunnels to the other, other parts of the, and they actually were a little scary. They were like, you know, you didn't know where this was going or where that was going. And there had been uh, uh, like haphazard renovations done that, you know, kind of made it weird down there. And, I mean, it's all cleaned up now. It's beautiful. It's just, I mean, the whole campus is gorgeous now. Uh, but back then it was, you know, a little... It, it had its age. It showed its age, yeah. and uh, it, but that was charming, though. I mean, the, the uh, it had a kind of a gothic feel, you know, a gothic charm back then, anyway. Do you think you lose something when you when you when you fix something that's falling apart? Yeah. Well, I was in on. Uh, I did a lot of filming of the architects when they uh, were doing discussions and stuff. They wanted to have a kind of a record, so they picked me just because I know how to operate a camera. I'm not good at it, but I can operate a camera. And so I heard a lot of the discussions about how, what the renovations were going to, you know, what, what they were doing and, and some of the care they were taking. I was actually quite impressed with some of the, the things they cared about, like the, the, the black iron window frames and things. They wanted to keep all that original and then didn't want to swap any of that out. Um, they, I don't know, I, I listened to them and I, I was happy. Because uh, you couldn't keep it the way it was. It was, it was either demolish it or, or make it better. Right. There was, those were the two choices. Yeah. And it would have been, I mean, demolishing it might, you know, that's a valid thing. I mean, you, they would have, that's the way it, history goes sometimes. Yeah. But uh, no, I don't, they did lose a little bit of the quaint, I don't know, it's yeah. it's not as run down now, so it doesn't feel yeah. as quaint and gothic. Yeah. You know, it feels yeah. it feels quite nice in there now. It feels yeah. pleasant. I still enjoy working there a great deal. I will say that I worked in the College Avenue, the college building before the renovation, yeah. and uh, there were very few of us in there because it wasn't really a building you could work in. Yeah. You know, um, but I did have a, an entire office to myself on the third floor and back then the offices were huge they were enormous and I had like three windows looking out over downtown the ceiling was like way above my head you you could it, it was you could have an elephant in that room easily and I was alone up there on that floor so it was very good living for a little while but I mean you can't sustain you can't have an entire floor of a building like that just for me <laughs> but I did enjoy that I did enjoy watching the renovations happen though I, I was happy I mean, the, the ceilings were high, and the, the windows were gigantic in that yeah. office. Like, three gigantic cathedral-ish windows. You could literally get a, a killer whale through those things if you had to. Like, yeah. yeah, just in case. Just in case. Well, well you need a hoist, but now you can get a killer whale through those windows. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, how many, how many performances would you have done with Regina Little Theater over the years? Oh, well, I started in the 80s, and I was gone for uh, some years. Uh, to, yeah. Yeah. Prince Albert, Saskatoon was my wife. But uh, okay. over, uh, over the years, I don't know, three dozen maybe. Wow. Oh, yeah, I'd say yeah. three dozen. And, and there's main stage plays and there's one act cabarets too. Uh, yeah. Little theater does, uh, back in the day, we did four, four shows a season uh, and some one acts whenever we wanted to. But now it's a little more uh, standardized. So we do five shows uh, for every, or we do five shows, is it five? Yeah, five shows a season, five performances per show. Right. Two two cabarets and one acts, uh, and I'm, I like the one act cabarets just as much as the uh, the main stage. Uh, they're a little less rehearsal, yeah. and uh, uh, they're just as much fun as far as I'm concerned. Um, we we perform at uh, the Performing Arts Center now, yeah. but uh, I, it you know and it, it's a good venue, but it doesn't feel quite as theaterish as Dark Hall did. Like Dark Hall, you really felt you were in a theater, yeah. you know. And uh, the Performing Arts Center is, is, is a great venue and it's, it's perfect for us, really. But uh, I do kind of miss that feeling of like, it really felt like a theater <laughs> at Dark Hall. Yeah, that theater sense that you got from the building, like, what do you think carried that? Was it like the, was it the old architecture? It Definitely, uh, everything, all the architecture was very theatrical, like yeah. the, even backstage, like everything was... It, it, I don't know much about architecture, but it felt like the, the architect wanted you to know you were in a theater even when you were backstage. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it, it had all the all the accoutrements of theater back then, and, and, yeah. and not even it was built for for a totally analog experience, right? Like when we build a theater now, we you've got a place for your mixing board and your lighting racks and stuff like that. But back then, I mean, uh, there was no light or mixing board, you know, so. Uh, 
backstage was there, you know, it was obviously you could do Foley back there if you had to, you know, you could have a, a stand of things to make noise with, you know, backstage and stuff yeah. like that. And, and you felt that, you know, you felt a very analog. It, yeah. I, I like that. I, I, I like, I'm old, I'm a very old guy. Yeah. I, I work in the digital medium now. Yeah. I, I embraced it when it showed up because, I mean, it was obviously the future. But I do still like the old style of, uh, honestly, uh, I really miss uh, real Foley. That's one thing I yeah. miss more than anything. Uh, everything's all, you just sample a door closing or uh, whatever yeah. and you play it through the computer on the soundboard, you know, and that's yeah. how you get your door closing sound. But back in the day, man, you, there'd be it's like a, a, a door back there that somebody was slammed shut, yeah. you know, and, and uh, there'd be pots and pans for making noise and there'd be like a box of uh, cornstarch that you'd squeeze for somebody walking through the snow and stuff like that, you know. Uh, I, I really enjoyed stuff like that, and, and uh, you you really got the feeling that Dark Hall was was you know part of that entire world. I mentioned the Puff Wheat Factory. It's yeah. a it's a kind of a blue green building yeah. on. Oh, you know, do you, you actually remember it? Do you see oh, it on, on Sass Drive? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's abandoned now. I mean, nobody. Yeah. It's behind the paint store. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I mean, the floor probably falling through it, or yeah. even back then you would fall through the floor. Um, no, we'd party there. I mean, it was. A, it's a disastrous old building. Nobody cared. I mean, it was things were looser back then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was a miserable business, though, because Dark Hall is a long way from Sass Drive, and uh, when you're hauling a set and it's like 35 below, and you're moving the set out of Dark Hall into the truck and then drive back, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> those were late nights, late cold nights. <laughs> Post show is always great. Yeah. Nobody had mentioned until you that it used to be a puff wheat factory. That's what we always called it, the puff wheat factory, and I'm sure it was puff wheat factory. Yeah, I, I say that just because I've heard it a thousand times back right. in the day. I could be completely wrong, but I do remember them pointing out that nobody back then you smoke. You know, in the '80s, you smoked inside, eh? Yeah. Uh, and somebody said, no, "Do not smoke inside here because there's puff wheat dust everywhere." <laughs> I don't know if it was true or not, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> I, you know, I can't remember when we stopped uh, performing at Dark Hall, but it wasn't that long after I started. I don't think I did that many shows, but definitely, uh, director of the opera is burned into my brain when I was. I mean, your first time on stage is, is yeah. like, that's going to be, that's something you remember forever, so. And, yeah, no, I can see Dark Hall so clearly, the whole thing. Nothing ever collapsed on us there, not that I remember. <laughs> if, if I would say anything about Dark Hall, is that they, they did not have a lot of wing space at Dark Hall. Yeah. You, uh, you pretty much were scrunched in there. If there were a bunch of you waiting to go on, you were mashed in there pretty tight. You got to be friendly yeah. with each other, because... <laughs> Yeah, there was not. There still isn't. I don't know. I don't know if they're actually what they're doing about that because there was never a lot of wing space. There's a lot still. Yeah. I think they could fly stuff up actually pretty high in Dark Hall, but I, I remember being young and not caring about old things like old buildings, yeah. old heritage, anything. But as as I grew up, as I got older, I started noticing them, and, uh, and now I'm at the point where I I, I think they are very important because. You need that, that sense of history. With, without old buildings, really, uh, what is there to, to, I mean, there's old, you, you look at trees, I mean, trees are old and stuff, but I mean, they, they'd be here without us, right? <laughs> they give you a, just a bit of a sense of, of human history, I guess, and, and uh, what we've done, and a little bit of who we were. You can see traces of who we were in the architecture, you know? Um, because people have changed over the, the decades, and and our, our architecture reflects that, you know, it becomes whatever it's become and various things. But the old buildings like Dark Hall, I don't know, I just, I like to put my hand on the rock out, you know, the brick out there and just, just touch it. And, and I think of, I, I, when I was uh, in my, my office uh, in College Avenue, which was built at the same time as Dark Hall, um, I liked looking out the, the windows and thinking that, like, those windows have been there for a hundred years. The, the, that pane of glass is all warped and, and it gives me a, a distorted view. But how many people have looked through that pane of glass at the downtown view I'm looking at? That fascinates me. 
I, I, that might bore other people to tears, but I look through that pane of glass and I think about all the people who have looked through that glass over the years. Uh, people not that different from me, or maybe a lot different from me. It's, it's just fascinating to me. You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR, tuned into the community. Don't forget, I'm, I just celebrated my 86th birthday, so, <laughs> right so the memory kind of goes away, but yeah. uh, no, I'm still conducting bands. Uh, Are you uh, really? We have the uh, Prairie Winds, it's an adult band, yeah. uh, but uh, we have As I was looking into groups and organizations who put on shows at Dark Hall, I learned that bands like Regina Lyons Band performed there many, many, many times. And when I called up the Saskatchewan Band Association to see if they could shed any more light on that, they told me to get in touch with Bob Mossing. I was soon to learn that everybody involved with band in Regina knows Bob Mossing. He is a revered figure in that community. More than just a local band celebrity, he's been a champion for band in the province for as long as anyone can remember. At 86, he is still a band leader and clarinetist, and over his life he has taught band to hundreds of young people in the province. When we got together, he told me about how his long, happy career in band began with his mother and a tragic family incident. Well, uh, the start of the history of the, Mo- the Mossing Band there, it started uh, like we moved in from Ben Goff, Saskatchewan. Right. And... Um, uh, we lived, my dad conducted the, Ars, uh, the Canadian Army Band, right. 12th District Depot Band, and so he was conducting band. My mom was being a housewife, and um, my oldest two brothers uh, were in the war, or fighter pilots for the Canadian Air Force, and um, everything was going fine, uh, but uh, my mom wanted to do more. She had to keep moving. So, um, but nothing happened much until my second oldest brother was killed in the war. Now that, she just, it took, my dad walked up and down 23 block Oster Street for, for about an hour and a half before he could tell, they never would tell you of a death then. They phoned, they telegrammed my dad, right. and then he had to go and tell my mom. Oh, my and he just walked up and down and up and down, finally got courage enough to walk in. Right. And so that sort of shook her. And she thought for a while, what am I going to do? And, and the history's right there. And she decided that she's going to start a band up. Wow. And so she started the band, it was called the Queen City Band. Right. And it, we practiced at um, uh, St. Joseph's School on Toronto Street, mm-hmm. or just off Toronto. It's now torn down. It's um, got high rises in there now. And um, so everything was going fine. She had people in the band by the name of John Vernon, the actor. Oh, really? Vernon Agopsowicz. It was in there. Okay. Uh, uh, he played tuba. Yeah. And like when she said jump, he said how high. And Adam Fall, he was a Canadian boxing champ. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> she was called the little general. Right. And it was like, now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> My dad was exactly opposite. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll do it tomorrow or the next day or whatever. But yeah. she, so, and we practiced at 2319 Osa Street in our kitchen. Okay. We had a big kitchen, so at six o'clock everything stopped and the band started, and it was in the kitchen. So um, that's how we got started, and then the Queen City band finally grew and grew and grew, and uh, now we're and then we had the Lions band uh, that I had. I, I in fact on my birthday I had uh, eighty or ninety four phone calls and 145 Facebook from band members really? on there. So, uh, so it started and we toured Europe and played in Europe and states and everything else yeah. here. Then the Lions Band folded and became the Mossing School of Music. Right. 
and the Mossing School of Music I retired two years ago and now I'm still going with the Prairie Winds out of that. Right. I played uh, clarinet. Okay. And that sort of was, <laughs> that, that was the only instrument left. My oldest brother played trombone, the second brother that was killed played baritone, right. my sister played trumpet, my next brother played trombone, all brass. My mom said, I've had enough of this, he's going to play clarinet, <laughs> whether I liked it or not. Right. And uh, I wasn't too fussy on the clarinet. Walking home from band, I kind of accidentally undid the screws on the clarinet case, and the case would open, the clarinet would fall out, and we had to get it fixed. Well, my dad would fix it the next day, and there I go again, try it. So, so but clarinet's my major instrument. Um, minor instruments are all of woodwind, uh, woodwind. Of course, being a band director, you have to know how to play them all. Yeah. But my favorite instrument still is clarinet. Yeah. Even after like having that like struggling to like fall in love with it at first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have any memories of like early performances that you did at Dark Hall and what that was like? Uh, uh, to be honest with you, no. But I can remember it was sort of the place to play. It was sort of like being at the. Uh, the best music home we had in Regina. And so when it was brought up that we're going to play at the Dark, at the dark Hall, we're going to play there. And uh, this was the Mossing, uh, the Regina Lines Band. And my mom said, yeah. Uh, we had white pants, white shirts, purple ties. And uh, my mom and dad both conducted. And uh, I remember going in that side door and you go up the stairs, and then the, the stage was right there. And the, the sound was fantastic. And, and they've even perfected that now. But no, we, we thought the dark hall, we, were going to the, we couldn't believe it that we were going to the dark hall. And we'd go there, we'd fill it. Uh, maybe, a, I'm guessing now, but maybe a, a 500 people with balcony and stuff and coming in and they had all the pipe organ, uh, the pipes on the side and I can remember that and, yeah. and it, was a, it was a pleasure to play at the Dark Hall right here in Regina and uh, over the years of course uh, w then we moved on uh, to other uh, uh, venues and uh, you know but we still can remember a time in there I can remember who played in there there was Famous Carol Gay Bell uh, yeah. in Regina here can call a, can call him up by name like and several have passed on now, but uh, no we um, this was this was the place to play for us and then we'd go downstairs and have a reception after or whatever the case may be but uh, no we were we were pleased and uh, uh, just to play in it. And the acoustics was great, and uh, no, that was our home. Yeah, yeah, we loved it. It was felt that we're from Regina. That's the Queen City. That was the Queen City's. People traveled to play in the Dark Hall. They came here to perform, and we thought, how fortunate are we? We're here, and we'll play at that. So we would have maybe two, three concerts a year at the Dark Hall. The Dark Hall was famous. Uh, I thought so anyway. And I'm sure if you talk to Carol or any of those others, hey, that was our time to shine, was to go to the Dark Hall. And I'll say it again today. And if I'm here when it opens up, I'm going to plan to go and be in the audience. So uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I enjoyed. The, the sound was fantastic yeah. then. And I imagine they've improved it now too. But it was a place to play, uh, and if if you wanted to do anything, you performed at the Dark Hall. How did you guys get the gig to play uh, the Rose Bowl and the Orange Bowl? Well, we had to apply. Okay. Uh, we had to apply for it, and um, uh, they, they wanted a Canadian band. They loved to have it, and uh, then they um, um, we had audition. We had to send a tape. And then they gave us a, a year notice to raise funds. We did the Rose Bowl, and then we did the 
orange bowl. The Rose Bowl was beautiful. Have you ever w watched? The, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. with the floats, and, it was, and we were part of that. But it was okay. And we, we well, well, okay. It was a big thing in our life. But then when we went to the Orange Bowl, it was a, a fun thing to be in because it was New Year's Eve. Right. People were drinking a little bit, maybe a lot, who knows. And when the band came through, we started out playing traditional marches. And then I made this decision, let's pep this up to people that they know, that they could sing along with. And we marched by, and they was like having a choir with us. Nice. And so, no, it's, it's uh, the whole thing you have to, my th theory of teaching is you've got to entertain the crowd. Yeah. So you mentioned before how um, with parades and stuff now, there's, you know, it's gone down from having multiple marching bands mm -hmm. uh, in succession to having just one, just having the pep band. Um, what can you say about that loss of that band culture that we seem to be? Oh, I, I, think, uh, I think the loss of a band in a parade and, and stuff is, it's the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. Like, you know, I appreciate looking at floats. I appreciate watching a car go by with somebody in it, but to see a marching band come by, and in fact, I remember with the Lions band, we used to do a, a little routine on the street from In the Mood, where the kids would do a dance step and maneuver, and they always put us to the end of the parade because people would leave after the band performed. Ah, let's go. So, uh, we, you know, the kids would say, how come we can't go first? Because they want the band to keep the crowd. Yeah. But uh, a parade without a band is not a parade. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody out there want to argue with me, go ahead. <laughs> Huge thanks to Marianne Woods, Dan Carr, and Bob Mossing for sharing their memories of Dark Hall. You have been listening to Out of the Dark, an exploration of Dark Hall through stories. This series was made possible thanks to the generous support of Sask Arts and the University of Regina Conservatory of Performing Arts. Dark Hall is situated in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Makeshift Nation. Music for Out of the Dark is from Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, 465, and performed by Christian Robinson and Hang Han Ho on violins, Jonathan Ward on viola, and Simon Fryer on cello. They are Regina Symphony Orchestra performers. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Thank you for listening. <laughs>